Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to a user education. Um, we continue talking about um, waves and uh, their energy. And our examples of waves and their energy were two actually. For longitudinal um, oscillations, we were using a spring, and for transversal, we were using a rope. Now, since we are um, trying to go just slowly towards properties of light and energy of light, which is transversal um, oscillations of uh, uh, electromagnetic field, we will concentrate today on the energy of rope as it oscillates. Now, this is um, the final lecture which is dedicated to energy of uh, transversal oscillations, mechanical oscillations. Um, and let me just remind you how um, I have structured this particular topic, energy of waves. Well, the first lecture was actually very simple. It's about longitudinal oscillations of uh, the spring. Now, the second lecture was involved in basically properties of oscillations of rope by itself and it was a differential equation which is called wave equation um, which delivered the solution to uh, wave waves on on a rope now then i spent some time modeling transversal oscillations with longitudinal that was the previous lecture and today i'm going to use this particular model and i will definitely re re repeat exactly how it's done um, to calculate the energy of transverse transversal oscillations of rope so that's the plan now today's lecture is part of the course physics for teens it's presented on on the website unizor.com and I, I do suggest you to basically watch this lecture from the website because it contains all other lectures in the proper sequence there are menus etc etc um, also the unizor.com website contains prerequisite course called math for teens math is mandatory for uh, learning physics especially calculus vector algebra and some, something like this so, um, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website. And you can go to the website, there is a menu. The first level is basically the course, Physics 14. Then you go to Waves, and within that part of the course, you will find um, the topic which we are talking about right now. Light and energy and stuff like this. Um, now, the courses, all the courses are uh, totally free uh, you don't even have to sign in there are no advertisement so it's just pure knowledge for your ultimate enjoyment uh, also the website contains exams which you can take as many times as you want until you will feel comfortable ok, now back to, back to work so first let me just remind you the oscillations of the rope. So consider the rope. Well, you can consider it infinite, but if it's not infinite, it's a very, very long one. So there is one end which is uh, forcefully oscillating. Um, forcefully, it means somebody like myself. I just took the end of the rope and move it up and down in um, harmonic uh, oscillations which can be described as this where A is obviously an amplitude well T is time and omega is angular speed or angular frequency sometimes it's called the same thing so um, incidentally speaking about angular frequency so we will just be clear there is a plane frequency called f which means number of oscillations 
per second. Now times 2 pi, it would be an angular, which is basically what is the angle per second, how much in radians we are moving per second. So that's just another thing. So we have this particular um, uh, the way how we oscillate the end of the rope. Now, what's the result of this? Well, the result of this is the following. If you will take this is as y-axis, and this is x-axis, and the rope is stretched along the x-axis, so the rope will start waving, obviously. Now, I can always have the function called y of x t, which is basically the level, vertical level, the rope uh, uh, arises at time t at point x. So basically this is an equation of this particular point. It goes up and down, up and down, and the equation is a times cosine omega t minus k x where k is some constant if x is equal to zero which means it's this point we will have a cosine omega t which is just this one now the further x from the zero the uh, delay will be basically introduced into the same um, level of rising this particular point. So this point, for instance, is oscillating exactly like this one, but with a time delay. Now, let me just change this slightly. Cosine omega t minus k divided by omega x. That's the same thing, right? I just took omega out. Now, in the previous lecture, uh, where I was talking about uh, oscillations of a wave and the properties, basically, of, of these oscillations, we came out with uh, this very simple thing. So. I have proven there that the speed of um, propagation of the waves on a rope is related to the parameters k and omega this way. That's part of the previous lecture. If you don't remember it or you didn't really see the previous lecture, I do suggest you to go to um, the lecture which basically explains it. I think it wasn't exactly previous, it's the one before previous. The previous was about modeling mm, transversal with longitudinal. So this is very important because if I will use this, I can rewrite it as a times cosine omega minus sorry omega t minus x divided by v. Now this in this form, it's very obvious the x divided by v is time it takes for the wave to come from here to here. This is x, v is a speed, distance divided by speed is time. So that's the time delay. So that's why um, this has much more physical sense. So in this particular form, this equation how this particular point is moving up and down has, uh, has, has real physical sense because it oscillates exactly the same as the beginning, the origin of oscillations, but with a time delay. So let's just keep it in mind. Okay. Now, what else can we say? On the other hand, um, there is a concept of a wavelengths and a period, right? So the wavelengths is lambda, period is, let's say, tau, and if you divide lambda, which is the wavelengths, 
between uh, crest and crest, let's say, or between trough and trough. And tau is the time it takes for the wave to go from uh, one end to another of one particular wavelength. That's also speed of propagation, right? So we have another formula. Now, what is the time? Uh, what, what is the period? How period is related to um, frequency, for example? Well, obviously, tau, it's the time it takes for one wave to go. And frequency means how many times per second. So obviously they are inverse to each other. If this is the time it takes for one wave, let's say one wave to cover the distance of one wavelength is, let's say, five seconds. Then what's the frequency? Well, you have to divide it, it will be one-fifth of the wave per second, right? Which means that I can put it here, lambda times f, right? I will continue this. Okay, and f can be done from here, so that's uh, omega divided by 2 pi. All these simple calculations, I, I did not like memorize it. I logically uh, try to um, come up with all these based on the concept, on the physical concept. So this is a speed. If this is a speed, then if you divide wavelengths by the time it takes to cover it, that would be the speed, right? The only thing which I do remember from the previous lecture is this one, because there is a little bit more, um, a little longer maybe proof that this is true. Everything else is pure logic. From here, we can come up with what? If this is equal to this, then k is equal to 2 pi divided by um, by a lambda, right? I have lambda here, sorry. Lambda. And instead of f, I put f uh, omega divided by 2p. So k would be equal to 2 pi divided by lambda, right? This is equal to this. So let's just keep it in mind, and that's all basically which is needed right now. Now I will wipe it out, and then we will go to properties. Now, now let me go back to the model which we have built. How to model my uh, transverse oscillations with uh, longitudinal. So if you remember, we have decided to have a tiny spring from each point so that the neutral position of the spring is exactly on the neutral position of the rope. Okay? Now, the previous lecture was dedicated to how we built this model in such a way that the oscillations of the spring, of the springs, all these tiny springs, each one is carrying an infinitesimal piece of the rope with its mass, obviously. So how can we arrange so these springs would be exactly modeling the waves on, on, on the rope? Well, we have basically decided that we have to uh, establish these springs in such a way that they have the same amplitude of oscillations. And this is simple, because if you will stretch the spring by the uh, by A, it will oscillate from plus a to minus a. Okay, so the um, amplitude is satisfied. Now we know the mass which is attached to each particular tiny spring. The mass is it's a differential of mass, in infinitesimal, which is um, mass density per unit of length times differential of the x. 
Okay, this is x. This is y. So we know the mass, we know the amplitude. Now we have to create these springs in such a way that their oscillations will be exactly the same as oscillations of the rope. So the rope has omega as an angular speed, so we have to really come up with the uh, spring which has exactly the same frequency of oscillation. Now frequency of oscillation depends uh, on the spring and again if you don't remember it you have to go back to the corresponding lecture. So we have the formula omega square is equal to uh, coefficient of elasticity divided by mass. Now mass is gm, it's this one. So this is the mass at the top. Now obviously oscillations of a spring depend on properties, elasticity of the spring and what kind of a, how massive the object at the top of the spring in this particular case. Right? So it's equal to Ke divided by mu dx. So we have this. So we have to basically come up with coefficient of elasticity from this formula, k is equal to mu omega square dx. So omega square, omega we know because this is the rope. So we know what exactly kind of oscillations we are forcing the rope to move because this is the end of the rope which somebody is forcefully um, uh, moving up and down with certain um, angular frequency. So we just will take the springs in such a way that their coefficient of uh, elasticity is this one. So everything seems to be like doable. Okay, so after we have gotten all this, so we will do next the following. We will stretch all springs up to the level A, to whatever amplitude we need. But we will release them, not at the same time, but uh, with certain time delay. So we release first from the left and move releasing mechanism to the right. For instance, there is some kind of a plank which I put here, which prevents them to go down. And then I will moving the plank out with the speed of propagation of the wave on the rope. If I will do that, then my springs will start oscillating exactly in sync with oscillations of corresponding rope. As if all these individual pieces are attached to the rope, they would do exactly the same thing. And that's how my model is working. Okay? So, everything seems to be done properly. The only thing is we have to do, do this, releasing this thing with, with proper um, speed of propagation. And again, speed of propagation we, we know, basically, right? So that's all part of this deal. So what exactly do we need? Spring have the same, release, delay. Okay, now after we release them, we will have the, the following equation for um, each spring. Now, now this is a deviation from the, uh, of the top of each spring. Well, each it means on the distance x from the beginning. A, a very tiny spring where we have attached a tiny piece of rope. Not connected, obviously, to other pieces of rope. So now the rope doesn't exist. We have broken it down into small pieces. Well, infinitesimal pieces, actually. And this is for uh, each infinitesimal piece, which is on... Uh, the distance x and y is its vertical deviation. Well, it will have exactly the same cosine of omega t minus x divided by v. So this is the time delay. Um, where we will we, we know what we actually is. We were, we were already talking about this. <coughs> now, from another, from the classical point, it's omega g minus kx 
where k is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda. I just did it before, right? So we can look at the equation in this way or in this way. Now this seems to be simpler since we already know what k is. Um, written in such a way, k doesn't really present physical, you know, physical sense. But written in this way, that's obvious that this is a time delay. But that's the same thing, basically, right? <coughs> okay, so we know the equation. We know how each spring is basically moving, right? So this is an equation, or this is an equation for each spring, which is located at uh, x coordinate here, and at it depends on the time how it moves. What it means is that we can actually talk about energy of the spring and basically equate it to energy of the rope. Why? Because each infinitesimal piece of the rope, if it's on the rope, it does some movement. But if it's on the spring, it does exactly the same movement. If the movements are the same, then uh, the, the energy which this, this particular um, uh, piece of the rope, infinitesimal piece of the rope, would be the same. And that's basically my, my purpose of converting relatively complex movement of the rope with all these tension things, etc. It's kind of difficult. But when we are considering each point as attached to a spring, which has exactly the same parameters of oscillations as the rope, we can do it that way. And on a spring it's much easier. We have already covered this um, in, in all the details. So that's exactly what I'm going to do right now. So, now, let's just consider what exactly we want to do. Now, what does it mean we want the energy of the rope? Rope is long, infinite maybe rope, right? So what is the energy? It's infinite. Which means we have to really somehow um, have a, 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 a different task. So the different task which, which physicists consider to be reasonable in this case is what is the amount of energy each wave, the piece of the rope of the lengths equal to wavelengths from crest to crest. Because as, as, as the waves are moving, this difference between uh, difference in x coordinate of uh, between one uh, crest and another remains the same because the waves is just moving synchronously. All the waves are going without changing the distance between them. So the distance between them, which is a wavelength, that, that, that's basically the way how we are measuring the um, energy of the rope. So we need amount of energy which is contained in all the rope pieces of the lengths equal to wavelengths. So, considering that we know everything about the rope, le uh, about the, sorry, about the springs, so let's just find out the energy of one particular spring, and then we will integrate it by x from, let's say, from 0 to lambda, which is the wavelengths, or from 10 lambda to 11 lambda. It doesn't really matter because it's all, um, because it's periodic. Since it's periodic, I just can, can cut any piece of, um, <coughs> of x, um, which, which has a length of lambda, and integrate all the energy of all the springs there. Okay, Some, sounds simple, right? <coughs> so let's talk about what's the first. First is potential energy. Potential energy of a piece of the um, rope attached to a string on the distance x uh, at time t. So how can we do that? Well, here it is. <coughs> when we were talking about uh, the spring, we were talking about expression for potential energy, which is equal to this, Ke times 
mass um, times sorry times y square, right? Of x of t. So if spring has coefficient of elasticity e, and we have um, stretch it. Now, y is the direction of stretch. In, in previous lecture, we were using horizontal stretch, so it was x here. But now, x is a different coordinate. Stretching is towards y. So y is a stretch. The more we stretch, the more potential energy spring has. And it depends only on the amount of stretching and the coefficient of elasticity. So this is our um, uh, equation for uh, end mass. Sorry, yes, end mass. So we have to add the mass. Now this is the mass, obviously, at the end of this. Now it can be converted into one half. Now instead of ke. <coughs> We have to, we have just derived what exactly this is. It's omega square. Uh, now dm is mu dx, right? And y square is a square times cosine square. So my equation y of x t is equal to a cosine omega t minus kx. So cosine square of omega t minus kx, where k is equal to 2 pi over lambda, right? So we basically know everything about potential energy of one particular spring, which carries this mass and stretched by this, because this is how the spring is moving, well, the top of the spring is moving, right? So that's the amount of stretch. A square times cosine square, this is the square of the st stretch. And uh, uh, omega square and, uh, sorry, it's here. It's Ke equals to omega square dn. Yes, that's, that's the proper way. <coughs> so, we have this. This is amount of potential energy which is carried by one particular spring. It's based on the formula which we have derived in the previous one of the previous lectures which are dedicated to the spring. Now, all we have to do is we have to integrate it let's say from 0 to lambda, u of x of t, which is 1 half omega square mu a square integral from 0 to lambda, uh, cosine square omega t minus kx and dx. Now this is a trivial integral. Now in the notes for this lecture, and every lecture has notes. It's like a textbook, basically. I do it a little bit more detailed how to, uh, t how to get this integral. It's really very simple because cosine square is converted into cosine of a um, double angle. So cosine of double, it would be 1 plus cosine of double angle divided by 2, something like this. And if it's a plane cosine, not the square, then it's a trivial integral. Integral of, uh, uh, from, from the cosine uh, would be sine with special signs or whatever. And I will just give you the result. What's interesting is that the result does not depend on time. Why? Because we are integrating on the period. And when you integrate on the period, the dependency uh, on, on time basically disappears because no matter how you integrate 
whatever goes up in one place goes down in another place and they nullify each other. So that's basically the result of this and there is only dependency on all these parameters and obviously lambda. And the result would be and the result would be I'll put it here one quarter omega square mu a square lambda. So there is no dependency on t, on the time, and obviously there is no dependency on x because we are integrating by x. So this is amount of potential energy in a spring, wherever it is, but not in a single spring, in a, all the springs which amount to one wavelength. That's why it doesn't depend on time or or x. Great, how about kinetic energy? Well, kinetic energy, again, let's start from a single spring. What is it? One half mass, which is gm in this case, uh, times uh, square of the speed, right? But since we know, we know this, what is the square of the speed? Well, well, that's uh, derivative by time square. Now, derivative by time, it's very simple to take. That would be a sign. And then we will just have to take... In the, now, dm is obviously mu times dx. And then we will have to do exactly the same thing. We have to integrate it. And again, I put some more words into a textual description here I'll just give you the answer again to integrate sine square would be really simple it's exactly the same as to integrate cosine square and what's remarkable is that the result is exactly the same why because sine and cosine are very much alike they're just shifting one against another and if you take the whole wavelengths uh, then you will have exactly the same result and the result is one quarter omega square mu e square. Am I right? Lambda. <coughs> Great. Sum them up. Total energy is Now, I shouldn't really put it as u of x now and t because it doesn't depend. I should put really u lambda and k lambda. And e lambda is equal to, which is energy, which is energy concentrated in one, one wavelength of a rope. So one quarter and one quarter, it's one half. All right, so that's the total amount of energy. Now, let me just graphically represent the energy. Well, let's say you have a wave Now, let's just think about it. It means that our point went all the way up and then it will go down, right? So this is, the, for this particular x, the kinetic energy of this particular piece, infinitesimal piece, the kinetic energy will be zero at this point. Why? Because the speed first goes up, then goes out, down, which means in the middle, on the top, it's supposed to be equal to zero, right? Since it changes the direction. Which means my kinetic energy would be zero at this point. Now, at this point, 
it goes all the way down and continues to go down. So this would be the fastest piece. So this would be, therefore, my maximum of my kinetic energy. Again, this would be kinetic energy on the minimum at zero because speed is zero. And here again it would be on the maximum. So this would be my kinetic energy. Okay? Now what about potential energy? Well, potential energy should be um, opposite to, to kinetic because their sum is supposed to be the same. We still have the uh, conservation of energy. So whenever the point is at the very maximum, the corresponding string is at its top, which means it has the greatest deviation. So my potential energy would be at maximum here. And at this point, spring is back in the neutral position, so this potential energy would be zero. So if I do the potential energy, it would be like this. Whenever kinetic is at minimum, potential at maximum. Whenever kinetic is at maximum, potential is at minimum. So that's the graphical representation of both. But their sum is constant. Why? It's very simple. Potential energy depends on cosine square of something, if you remember, right? And uh, kinetic energy depends on square of sine of the same thing. And if you will add them together, cosine square plus sine square is equal to 1. So that's why the energy, total energy, is constant, does not depend on anything. I mean, it depends on properties of uh, springs, etc. It does not depend on the time or coordinate. And that is almost everything. Uh -huh. Okay. Back to energy. So energy of one particular wave, as I said, was equal to one half omega square mu a square lambda. Okay, that's energy. Now let's think about what is power. Power is amount of energy or work which is uh, exerted in, in uh, the unit of time. So what would be... Now this is the period. Well, this is the wavelengths, right? What if we will divide wavelengths by the time it takes for the wave to cover the distance? which means we will divide it by period, by tau. What is this? Well, this is speed. So, speed would result in the power. This is average power, obviously. The average power of one wavelength, wa wavelengths, would be equal to one half omega square mu a square and time and, and speed speed of wave propagation. So the more frequent oscillations are, or the faster these waves are delivering, the greater average power they are delivering, all these waves. Now these are all mechanical waves. We did not talk about light waves yet. Next time. Okay, now, I do recommend you to read the text uh, which is um, provided for this lecture, the notes. Um, it's like a textbook, basically. Um, and, uh, well, you have to really think about all these little formulas. Um, it's interesting what, what happens with energy, how it's delivered, etc. Um, another thing is, which I would like, actually, you to pay attention to, do not uh, try to memorize all these formulas. Try to find physical sense. Whatever I was doing in the very beginning of this lecture, I was trying to try to, fi to, to find the physical sense of all these coefficients. Um, like the kx, whatever, kx for, uh, in the formula for harmonic oscillations. 
Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much and good luck.